Abrucham Aboyim. Thank you for coming. Uh, tonight we're going to continue on the lecture we had last time we met about pain. And again, we were dealing with the, some of the positive aspects of pain, how it helps a person grow. I'd like to connect, continue with that just for a quick minute. Um, I was working out one day. I was watching a movie. And it dealt with a uh, marathon runner that ran, supposed to run in the 1972 Olympics. And the movie dealt with him and his coach, the person who started Nike. And um, he was talking to his girlfriend, and he said that he was going to win the gold. And the interesting thing was that his he told his girlfriend that he was going to win the gold medal in this marathon run that he was going to take. And he said he had a secret weapon. And she didn't ask him what it was. And I was thinking, the guy's running in his underwear. I mean, what kind of secret weapon can you have as a, as a marathon runner? And finally, later on in the movie, she finally asked him, what secret weapon do you have that you're going to beat all other world-class runners? And he said to her, I can endure more pain than anyone else. And it was amazing. Because that's what life's about. The ability to be able to continue to stay the course regardless of what gets in the way. Pain is not an obstacle. You ever watch the uh, thing about the Navy SEALs? The Navy SEALs are probably the best uh, army, best soldiers in the world. And what they train them to do is to take pain. They push them beyond human limits and then push them more. Because it's amazing what a person can do when he's pushed past his limits. There are no limits. The truth it is, anything that doesn't kill you will make you stronger. And again, that's what pain is. Being able to get past it and the joy of knowing that you're able to grow and succeed and be better than someone else, better than yourself, and succeed. But all of this is fine and dandy. But someone asked me, and it's true, what about other pain? What about sickness? Someone has cancer and death. What about a person who's in a coma? One who has Alzheimer's, dementia, children that are born with birth defects, handicapped, infantile deaths. What about that kind of pain? So how do we find a positive spin on that? That already seems to be the worst of worst. Well, I really don't believe in hell, um, but that's for another lecture and we'll deal with that. But I do believe that a soul comes into this world pristine and that at the end of life, that soul's returned back to God. And before it stands in front of God, just like if we were to go to see uh, a president, we would make sure to be clean, have clean clothing, smell good, look good. And so too, I think the soul, before it goes before God, has to be cleaned. And pain really cleanses the soul. Uh, just like gold or silver, and that's what every Jew is. Every person has that goodness to them. Gold and silver, but even gold and silver has to be refined to take away the impurities, to make it pure. And so too with us. And that pain, that heat. So what sickness does many times is that it cleanses the soul. And it makes people deal with God. It's interesting that people, when they're sick, make all kinds of deals with God. They really turn to Him and they start to look at their lives and they start to connect to the fact that maybe I haven't been all I should be and maybe I should be better. And they start to make these deals about how they're going to be better. And it's interesting that when they're sick, when they feel death at the door knocking, they promise God everything. And then if they recover, many, many times they slip back from when they came. In fact, you know, many times before a person dies, just before he dies, he feels a surge of strength. All of a sudden, a light. We know before the flood, that the week before the flood, it was supposed to be just like the world to come. The world was in the greatest joy. And then the flood came to the world. God many times will allow a person to feel like they're recovering, 
to see what they do. Do they still have that same desire to become better? Do they still have that same determination to change their ways? Do they still have that same want to come closer to him? You know, and not only that, with pain, whenever a person has pain, if a person goes to a dentist, to sit in a chair and just feel the pain is a waste of time. Especially a dentist, we use our mouths to sin in so many ways. A man is called a medabra, one who speaks. Then it's interesting, we have two eyes, two ears, two nostrils, one mouth. And the Rashbi, Rav Shem Bayachoy, the one who added to the Zohar, Kabbalah, said the person really should have had two mouths, one for the mundane and one for the spiritual. And he corrected himself right away and said, no, better a person has one, because he would use them both for the mundane. And God takes that mouth, that, those words, and protects them with a hard gate and a soft gate, teeth and, and, and your lips, to try to protect the person. So if a person sits in a dentist chair and he feels some pain, he needs to connect that pain to the fact that, may God take this pain for the times I've used my mouth incorrectly and help it be a kapara, an atonement, for those ways that I've sinned with it. And may I learn from this to speak better. And maybe I won't have as much dental pain at the same time. It's, it's an interesting thing. So how do we look at a person who is sick, a person who has Alzheimer's, uh, dementia? And there's a story told of Reb Zusha. Reb Zusha was uh, a great rabbi. But before he revealed himself to the world, he traveled around as an itinerant a beggar from town to town. And he looked, he had a scraggly beard, a patch coat, a rope around his waist, and he looked apart. And he gets to a town, and it was before Shabbos, and after services, the sext and the shamas is telling all the poor people in the back which house to go to for a meal. And somehow, the last person left was Reb Zusha. And the sexton had no place else to put him. So he told Reb Zusha, you come home with me. And when they went home, he sat Reb Zusha down at the table and he finished off the preparations for the meal. And when he looked at Reb Zusha, he saw Reb Zusha was <coughs> kissing himself. <laughs> and the shamus just shook his head. And he thought of Michigan. I got a crazy person here. And Reb Zusha looked over and saw the shamus looking at him. And he smiled and he said, I know you think I'm crazy. But let me tell you that a uh, esrig, a citron that we use on Sukkot, that all year it stays on a tree and nobody cares about it. But on that week of Sukkot, ah, everybody holds it, admires it, even kisses it, shows their friends. It becomes the featured item in the holiday, this, this esrig. And he turned to his host and he said, I'm a nobody and a nothing. I get that. But you see, you invited me home to your house. So I am now the item that you're using to fulfill the mitzvah hachnosis orchim, of showing hospitality to a guest. I have taken on a holy status. I'm like a pair of tefillin. I'm like a, a Torah. I am a holy object. Shouldn't I kiss myself? So when we see a person who is sick, a person who is in a coma even, who can't do anything, but people do mitzvahs, kind deeds through that person, when they help the person, when they bathe the person, when they say prayers for the person, this person becomes a catalyst, if you will, in helping them to gain reward for caring and makes them better people. So they really become holy objects. So we see that sickness does this even when a person doesn't know it, even in a coma. But still, how do we see people that are children, that are handicapped, and are challenged in life? You know, I was watching Dr. Oz one day. It blew me away. There was a young man, he was in his 20s now, was born with no hands and no feet. No hands and no feet. And he was sitting there in front of Dr. Oz and he was smiling. 
and he admitted to Dr. Oz that somewhere around the age of 11 or 12 he tried to commit suicide. And then he found God. This man had such a radiance about him and such a smile. It was amazing. And he had a child even, and his wife was going to have another child. He did not accept his handicap as a negative. He used it and got past it. The truth of the matter is the only people in life that are handicapped are us. When people know that they have to work harder and they have to push harder, they do that. People without arms learn how to use their feet. It's amazing. People use the, 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 these, these, these handicaps as incentives to become stronger. It's us who should be pitied. But more than that, there's a story told of the Hassam Sofer, a great rabbi, Germany I believe it was, in Hungary rather. And a woman came to him just before Shabbos with a chicken. And she asked him, is the chicken kosher or not? Kosher trait. And he told her there was a young man in town, a young boy, who was nine years old, who had never spoken a word, a deaf mute. Go to him and ask him whether the chicken is kosher. Being a believer, she didn't even ask him about that fact that the boy had never spoken. She went to the young man, showed him the chicken, said kosher or treif. And the boy looked at the chicken and said kosher and died. Now, you can imagine what a turmoil it was in the town. One is the boy spoke a word and then he died. What's this all about? And they went back to this great rabbi and they said to him, what's this? And he said that sometimes in heaven you have a great individual that dies. And that's who this boy's soul was. This boy had the soul of a great rabbi who on Friday afternoon, a widow had come to him and asked about a chicken. And he was in a hurry. And he told her the chicken was not kosher and it was. And she spent that whole Shabbos without the food to eat and very unhappy. And when he got to heaven, they said to him, everything about you is pristine, but this one thing blocks you from going to the highest levels of heaven. So they said, go back. And he said, no. If I go back, maybe I'll lose more than I gain. So they said to him, we will put you in a container that you cannot sin in. And that was the body of a nine-year-old boy who was a deaf mute. And when he said the word kosher, that freed his soul to go to the highest places in heaven. So when you see a child who seems to be handicapped, who seems to be autistic, who seems to have all these, ch all these problems, hug him and kiss him because he's a great soul. And you don't know what's inside. It's interesting that when children die at young ages, two-year-olds, I know a child died after a, shortly after a bris. How do we understand that? It says that, what's the next world? It says, Sadikim Yoshvim Yatrasem Hashem, that the righteous sit with crowns in their heads, and they enjoy the ray of the Shekhinah, of divinity of God. That's what they enjoy, the ray. But it says in the Gemara, who is the teacher of these children? God Almighty himself. Not a ray, but God himself. And if all we have when we get to heaven is the ray of this divinity of God, they get the full thing. So we see that somehow, some way, a person needs to know, a person needs to believe, Olam Chesed Yibana, that this world was created for kindness, and it becomes our job to see things in perspectives. And that when we feel pain, we need to associate it with some sort of goodness. That it cannot be for nothing. That a benevolent God is trying to wake us up. That anything that happens in our lives, no matter how negative it may seem, is really a positive. That it will make us better. It will make us stronger. It will make us happier. It will make us better human beings. And give us what we need, which is our reward in the next world, which we can receive in a second if we do what we need to do, even if we're forced to do it. May God help us that we see it properly and he gives us the strength to deal with life in a proper way so that we all can gain that final reward of the hereafter, which is really the true life in this world. Thank you for coming. Have a good night.